decided to combine everything all together of this day, the, the ending of this day. So this is the open panel for everything you can, we can discuss during, for the sharding uh, research, implementation, the roadmap, the plan, the happy thing, the sad thing. <laughs> so let me start from this. So um, these three days we discussed some phase one and phase two plus, and we dig, um, in, dig into some basic important topics like the BLS, the Stark, the proof of custody, and it wasn't and P2P, and Viper, and everything. And um, so first question is, what do the researchers think of what we can do immediately? Well, first of all, you can build a plasma chain because that doesn't require waiting for anything. <laughs> and now it's a plasma panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness Vlad's not here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, it's okay, V. I hope we didn't hurt your priors too much. <laughs> inside jokes, inside jokes, Bayesian. Um, so, I mean, one thing definitely, peer-to-peer -peer network, that is something that definitely stood out to me. The fact that Xiao Wei, I remember multiple months ago talking with Xiao Wei, trying to figure out this pub sub thing and saying, you know, just use libp2p and then realizing that that's just not going to scale up. And so hearing that it's still definitely an issue, it seems like that's, you know, right away we need to solve a peer-to-peer -peer network that, that, you know, can work for scalable peer-to-peer -peer applications because we not only is sharding one of peer, one peer to peer application, but there are going to be a huge number that hopefully can reuse some of the work that we do. So that's at least one. On the lib P2P stuff, we're not certain whether it'll work or not, right? So we should probably do some like load testing. Um, I know some of the teams are interested in like writing code in reference to the beacon chain, and I think that you should um, to get more familiar with the spec and to kind of open the dialogue about some of the um, maybe edge cases and things that we all need to think through from an implementation side. Um, so if you want to write some code, write some code. Um, I think that we were talking about opening a Gitter channel that's a kind of beacon chain Gitter channel where we can discuss um, the beacon chain spec specifically and to discuss some of these proof of concept implementations um, further as we've been already this weekend. And I just want to mention that um, so it's an open discussion. So if anyone has some thought, please just raise your hand. So I, um, yes. one interesting question I've heard kind of from a number, a few different sources is the, um, and I, I think that I, I have a clear understanding of this, but Justin can probably fill us in a little bit more. Um, the, the VDF, to some people the VDF sounds like, okay, we're just burning hash cycles again. Um, how is this not um, that? How is this not us just burning hash cycles like a proof of work implementation? Um, so w one thing I guess to mention that maybe wasn't clear is that the VDF idea is actually quite recent uh, and we haven't figured out all the details. Um, in terms of why VDF isn't like a, a race to zero where everyone burns a lot of electricity, I guess the reason is one, it's proof of sequential work as opposed to proof of parallel work. And two, um, the game is, is prone to, to being a monopoly. So basically whoever's fastest at um, providing these VDF outputs and proofs uh, can basically be the timekeeper, be this, uh, this, um, this participant in the network that uh, provides a heartbeat. Um, so in terms of um, attacks that, uh, that can happen, there's, 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 there's two ones which, um, which Vitalik uh, found. Um, Number one is kind of the, the, um, the more obvious one. So if um, 
So the, the main problem is basically uh, an attacker with um, customized uh, hardware which can uh, compute the VDF faster than everyone else. So there's two bad things they can do. Number one is kind of um, not reveal, publicly reveal the VDF outputs, but still know them before everyone else and um, basically um, be able to grind um, the the entropy pool, which is uh, based on Randall, in order to get a favorable uh, random number um, at the other end. Um, and I guess the second attack is, um, in order to keep the five second uh, heartbeat, uh, we need a difficulty adjustment. And so the worry is that if there is an attacker who's, let's say, 10 times faster than the rest of the network, they will push up the difficulty quite high. And if they suddenly go offline, um, then we don't want the whole system to stall. Um, and uh, it, it, it turns out that um, so long as we can get the advantage to be reasonably small, let's say on the order of, of 10 or, or 20, meaning that the, the attacker is no faster than 20 times the, the rest of the network, then uh, we should be uh, okay. But, um, you know, I guess there's some uh, research work that needs to be done in terms of what is like the theoretical um, optimum you can, you can get with state-of-the-art uh, ASICs, uh, what can we do with GPUs and CPUs, what can we do with FPGAs, what can we do with um, like um, a very basic ASIC which wouldn't cost that much money uh, and make an informed decision based on that. Um, so to answer again the question of like why it would not just go back to a proof of work race more more clearly like basically because it's proof of sequential work your ability to do more work by burning more money is very sharply limited right so a yeah, twenty billion dollar um, attacker may be able to complete the work something like five times more than you know, like it, or um, than someone with a few hundred thousand dollars. So we're as opposed to, you know, like 50,000 times more, basically, because there is only so much that you can optimize um, a yeah, single-threaded computation. Um, and now one question that I think we should obviously look at is, like, if in, case, in the case that the system does settle into some kind of monopoly equilibrium, then basically no one else would be getting rewards, and so there would be no incentive for anyone else to uh, compete with the attacker and make sure that they're, and kind of help keep the advantage small. So, and there are tricks that you can do to try to kind of encourage the rewards to be more distributed. So, one example is that you can kind of combine the VDF mechanism with, say, with hash reveals. So you can, for example, encourage spe like specific like different uh, specific validators to uh, lay down a hash and that or a, a pre-image and then lay down the uh, pre-image of the hash as well as the, uh, VD the, the VDF result sometime later. And that would basically give that particular um, uh, staker a kind of monopoly right to the ability to make that particular VDF solution, and then you could assign them some kind of reward. So uh, there are still sort of economic optimizations to be worked out to make the design maximally safe. Uh, is my understanding correct that the motivation for adding this VDF gadget um, is because of issues with just a simple Randau for the random yes. number generator? Yes, so the uh, simple Randau basically has the problem that any particular participant can exert one bit of influence on the Randau by uh, basically not showing up. And this can affect uh, kind of like short-term randomness, so it can affect the kind of the or the sequencing of who's going to be a proposer and so forth. Now, there are ways to mitigate the effect of that. Uh, The what? Um, the order, so in the existing uh, Randau spec, the order of reveals is basically like you reveal every time you make a block, make a block proposal. If you, if you try to manipulate Randau by not showing up, then don't you get punished because you, you don't, do, you don't but the your... but the cost of one bit of manipulation is only one block reward, or at least the, it can't go much higher than one block reward. Wasn't the old Randau scheme, didn't it used to be you made yes, a big but the, deposit? The, no, so the old Randau scheme is allowed to have much higher penalties because it had really long periods for submitting the uh, random value. But here the period is like basically one block long. Hmm. 
Now, look, there are things potentially that we could do to sort of improve the economic parameters. So, for example, having a penalty for not showing up that's as large as, say, one ETH could be, a, could be an okay thing, especially if we yeah, create a lottery where if you do get incorrectly, then you get a reward of one ETH. So, it's, um, but, like, even still, the level of manipulability is fairly high. V. What do you think how a lot of these slower games go into currently? Um, by slower games, you mean VDFs or randos? No, the randos. The, the randos. problem is that there's still someone who is the last participant, and that last participant um, always has the ability to manipulate and seize all the information before them. Yeah, but it can be... Um, like, if like, it's parallel, mm -hmm. then there's still some last point of aggregation, and then the yeah, point of, of course, aggregation... But then you add the v I'm not saying don't have the VRF also. The VDF. Right. I'm not right. So I'm to not be clear, VDF when also. we're talking about the VDF, we are talking about VDFs on top of hash reveal data. So even if someone has a um, hypoth can hypothetically break the thing instantly, the security only degrades to Randall security. But so you, but you, so like why not do the most Randall secure thing anyways then, which is to have a deterministic order, sorry, pseudo random order of reveals as a function of the previous Randall. That, yeah, that's kind of what you have if you have like block proposals, proposals that are a function of the previous rando. But then you have to wait for you have to wait for a whole for 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 a whole like dynasty mm -hmm. um, quorum to make blocks. Um, oh, you mean like basically the fact for that the, the new data is delayed? You should, yeah, you should be able to do get, still get new random numbers at every block. No, well, you definitely cannot get like the VDF root level and manipulability for numbers every block because you have to have this large disparity between the time you're expected to submit and the time the numbers start being used to be. Um, yeah, there's a large disparity, but if you have like lots of them going concurrently, you can always have one. But the expiring. problem is that each and every one of those uh, Randall reveals still would still the data would still only be usable after like ten minutes or whatever, so you're not getting much. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, there were some talk about how um, the signatures between blocks, say, there, if, if there, are, if we go with the attestation uh, design. Um, how we effectively do communicate these signatures. I haven't thought about it too much. Um, is that something that does fit into the lib P2P or the P2P layer? Is that something that any of the team has thought about? I mean, I guess the nice thing is that it's, it's not part of the consensus part of the protocol. It's just the networking part, uh, and so, it can be optimized over time uh, as more and more validators come in. Um, yeah. Um. I guess validators could theoretically, based off of when they know from the shuffle how they need to organize, they can like pre-organize their um, networking layer and find out who they need to be talking to. I mean, there. You know, Vitalik was talking about sharded aggregation, but there are some designs which are basically already naturally sharded aggregation. So um, if, for example, we fix the committee size to 1,000, uh, then, you know, every shard will produce these crosslinks aggregating 1,000, and then these crosslinks get, um, you know, put into the beacon chain, and the proposer of the beacon chain doesn't have to do the aggregation. It's already been done in, in, in the shards. I'm personally not too worried about it. Um, but yeah, that's a really cool property of BLS that you can do these incremental aggregations. So uh, just uh, do one by one. So another thing you can do is just uh, um, pass along the signature and then just keep incrementing by one in kind of a round. Like as I mentioned, you can, uh, pass, you can kind of pass along and aggregate in a tree structure, and the tree structure doesn't even need to be explicit. They can just kind of emerge in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? You could have basically individual nodes that, spe that specialize in aggregating uh, signatures for like some particular slice of the uh, proposer space, and then uh, 
Well, if you do that, then with two rounds of communication, like aggregating 50,000 BLS signatures goes down to the work of aggregating like uh, two, 200 for, this, uh, for the same val one validator. So one thing that I definitely uh, got out of this was that people are interested in these like increment, incremental steps, right? There's like a lot of uh, uncertainty around maybe like the cross shard communication, for instance. That's like something that we haven't even really talked about um, outside of like last time. You know, there um, are. Here's a very fun incremental one. Um, use the exact same algorithm as the, like basically implement a, the proof of sig beacon chain using exactly the same algorithm and use this as a plasma chain. Hmm, that's fun. Um, using the, uh, well, the algorithm that like is similar to, uh, the, that we've thought of and is similar to what we've written up but we haven't fully written up yet. Like, Basically, all that you really need to know is that, like, from the point of view of the plausible contract, all that you need to know, all that you need to know is you need to have an on-main chain contract that can uh, implement, uh, verify aggregate BLS signatures, which you can already do, and then um, you can, like, basically that by itself can give you a plasma chain with a uh, like decentralized uh, block production. And and. I don't know, at least one kind of incremental thing is definitely, you know, you have the peer-to-peer the -peer stuff, but then also there was this, you know, Casper FFG with all the, the uh, you know, uh, votes and those kinds of messages and, and definitely learning about kind of doing a beacon chain where you don't actually fill in the details and then you use just kind of like stubbed randomness, but getting that FFG mechanism working to finalize the main chain, I think is definitely a good step, right? Because it does give you some more economic security, it maybe doesn't give you the randomness that you would want, which is clearly still being figured out. You have some ideas. What do you think we should talk about? What's, your, what's on your mind? Um, who here thinks we should talk more about Starks? <laughs> Woohoo! <Okay. Yes. laughs> Um, who here thinks uh, we should talk more about plasma? Okay, we got one. Hey, two, three. Wow. Okay. Who here thinks we should talk more about why Vlad doesn't like plasma? Oh, I mean, okay, I'm just gonna say plasma is a design pattern which you can use and it is like, it, there's no, okay, maybe the only complaint about plasma before I go into my emotional rant, um, it's, <laughs> The, my complaint with plasma is that it has been used as a kind of like umbrella term for a huge number of kind of vaguely proposed protocols, and that is kind of a little bit lame, right? I, I totally, totally agree with that. And it's a lot of marketing. I mean, damn, that plasma implementers call good marketing. No, um, but like the, the, I think that the general concept of plasma is definitely a unique thing that, you know, using a more secure root chain to provide guarantees on transaction ordering on a you know transactions that are not submitted on chain until like the last minute for instance right this is this is definitely something that is useful and also like the merkle proofs and the, it, it kind of i think spurred a lot of interest in you know building scalable smart contracts which i think is a huge positive so i don't think that like okay yes it has this hype and yes it has this you know these downsides where people who have no idea what they're talking about kind of talk about it, but at least they're talking about scaling blockchain, decentralized solutions with, you know, economic security. So that's why I like it. I lo but I love you, Vlad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love you too, Carl. Oh. In you two guys who are uh, actively writing the spec, in your opinion, is... Um, are we, do we have a general framework? Like is, or do we, are we gonna change this in a month? Oh, like, <laughs> like, like the general structure of like the fact that there's a beacon chain in the way to track the proof of work chain. Correct, like correct. Um, in, 
it definitely is. And it definitely is a framework. Um, so, I mean, first of all, we can kind of think about possible deviations that like could conceivably happen, right? So one possible deviation is basically going right back to uh, making the beacon, the, all of the logic of the beacon chain fall right back into the proof of work chain and basically just doing a hard fork of the proof of work chain that adds beacon chain logic. Um, my main argument against this is basically, uh, number one, it would require a hard fork, which is like a higher level of load on client developers. Um, and uh, number two, it would be kind of, it would be more risky because a lot of our simplifications uh, that we're making have to fairly significantly leverage the fact that the beacon chain has a form of finality. And that simplifies, a lot. basically for example, if the shard chains can only depend on the finalized portion of the beacon chain, then that basically means um, that you don't need to have like funny dependent fortress rules and that simplifies a lot of client logic. Um, you don't need to worry about like the, the, the idea that something which was a cross shard dependency of some shard transaction is like it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes rolled back because the only thing that can roll back is stuff within the same shard. Um, it's, so it, it creates abstractions that are kind of nice in a bunch of way and if you fork the proof of work chain then basically it doesn't have those abstractions until everyone agrees to use and trust the uh, proof of stake fork choice rule. So it's, um, like, I do, I do think that it's, uh, like, that approach is inappropriate, at least for early stages. Um, but, like, I mean, that is a conceivable strategy, right? So, um, the, another thing that could end up changing is the proof of stake changes to some form that does not have a beacon chain and uses some fancy um, tangle hash graph dig T, uh, TMR copyright patent pending in order to uh, process uh, data, uh, yeah, data on shards anyway. Um, so, and I personally don't favor that basically because those kinds of protocols tend to be more complicated um, and don't have, you know, fortuitous rules that are, um, you know, like basically it's um, like having a, uh, okay, final, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just said how because, like, to be honest, like, I, I always feel like kind of an outsider when it comes to sharding. Mm. Uh, but I guess, like, the thing you're talking about is pretty complicated on its own. Yeah. So it's just. So, like, if so you're talking you're happy about. happy that it's sometimes more complicated. Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, like, maybe, yeah, sorry for interrupting you in this weird way, but. Uh, I guess the basic question was like before was uh, do we have a general framework and that would be like genuinely interesting for me as well like are we just gonna stick to I mean I've seen the design evolve over time right and I feel like at some point there should be you know this point mm. where we can just like, kind of rely on like certain things being present or not being present or, like, um I agree um so I guess like this is sort of me trying to flesh out out loud sort of the level of certainty that we can have, say, even over the like, very general concept of like the beacon chain construction. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, so, like, so for example, we've had a concept of a central, be of some kind of central beacon chain pretty much always throughout the entire design, right? Even since like literally 2015. Yeah. Um, the concept of the beacon chain being temporarily separate from the main chain is a new idea, but at the same time, like in, so if realistically for that, you know, like you give it a couple of months before it solidifies, but there's a, yeah, like, it does seem like we did move toward this approach from the other approach for, uh, for a reason, suggesting a reduced likelihood of moving No, back. I, I yeah. get it. But yeah. So the, the question is, I think it makes a lot of difference in people's heads though. Like, Agreed. You, that's like the kind of thing. So, you know, it, right. when, when, when you talk oh. about, you know, storing the like shot state on the main chain or storing it on like a separate chain, it makes a lot of difference for people, even though, you know, Agreed. conceptually, so there's like not that big difference. So you give other things that are set in stone, fairly. Yeah. Um, so one example is the concept of like proof of stake where you deposit and then you become a validator and then you do stuff. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The concept that you, base, you have some form of random sample selection and you get assigned to validate some data over here, then validate some data over there. And these like random samples are used as, um, as a way of convincing the rest of the network to accept the data. Yeah. Um, so like one kind of, the, like the fact that there is sharding in general. So even that by itself, like 
So, for example, I do think that there are enough details set in stone to make it possible to work on a peer-to-peer -peer network for it. Yeah. 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 No, but I get it. So the, these things, I think, more or less everyone agrees with by now. Right. Yeah. But it always feels like there's like a lot of like really tiny details like in some corner, and then there's like more complexity there, and even more complexity there, and there's just right. never this thing where you can just say, you know what, this stuff for like, now this done. This is the spec. Um, yeah. yeah. So even if it's not the whole spec, you know, just right, parts right. of it. Yeah. So like to be fair, even. Like uh, Ethereum 1.0 did not end up hitting a uh, spec freeze until something like a year after development started and six months before launch. Yeah. Um, though, I mean, like, there is a rationale for saying that, oh, maybe we should have, like, not bothered with receipt routes or whatever, and uh, that would have uh, gotten it and stuck with the POC5 spec plus security audits, and that would have gotten things out faster. But, um, no, it's okay. Yeah, it's it's okay. okay. So, no, I mean, like, we do still hear the concerns, and you know, like, we are trying. Yeah. I personally think it may be like a good idea to come up with some kind of maybe document that outlines in a very clear, cohesive manner all the like all the different pieces, right? Because there is there is this there's first there was the like friendly finality gadget where the slashing conditions needed to be worked out. And then there was the, you know, how does block proposal work? And for a while it was just, you know, proof of work block proposal and we kinda like called it a day, but then we realized that the a Poisson process wasn't going to really cut it and we wanted these like five second incremental block times and so going straight to a beacon chain made a lot of sense and it also you know felt good because we were already doing hybrid Casper but then once you have the beacon chain it's like okay block proposal where is your how are you going to do block proposal for each one of these shards and then once you get there it's like okay what EVM are we running and what you know cross shard communication do we have and you know and all this stuff requires a really robust peer to peer network so i feel like these things exist in some minds but they're not really very well communicated right now and so you know what i'll do i will happily you know help work on a document to kind of like make pretty pictures and and make it all seem to make sense in a cohesive story because there is a cohesive story that has been going on with the you know development team with you know Vitalik and Justin but it's just you know hard because there are so many details this is a huge huge project but we are the Vitalik is the bomb okay <laughs> so, <WTF made. laughs> so maybe like I mean maybe you're gonna take this as a joke but I guess maybe you should just write a book about it I mean like about the story because that, that's actually not a joke. Because what I'm trying to say is that you know a lot of these decisions that you guys are making on the protocol, they do make sense in some context if you have all the previous well, information, guess, if you know what what kind of be, alternatives like, have been considered. To be fair, like this, I mean, like the book has been written; it just needs to be aggregated. I would it's say, true. I mean, like which kind of is the criticism we've gotten in a lot of places? Like there's all these ETH research posts and like Medium and uh, like. Live, live streams and whatever, and like, they do need to be in one place more, which you know, we will try to do more of. Yeah, thanks. Definitely. So I guess just to comment a little bit on the, um, the way we work, I guess we are very much uh, intuition driven, and you know, that, has means, that, that means that you know, we, we don't have this solid framework and we're happy to, to pivot quite fast. Um, I guess the advantage is that uh, we get to really explore lots of different design paths, and so our, you know there's this feedback loop where our intuition keeps on getting better and better, and it feels like the the dark rooms that are unexplored in the in the design paths are starting to one by one get illuminated. So there's definitely this feeling of progress. Another thing is that every once in a while, um, you know, we make like a, a 10x improvement. And then these 10x improvements kind of compound on each other. So, you know, attestations, BLS, proofs of custody, you know, these may be each kind of order of magnitude improvement. And so I think there is value to, um, to try and get as many of these as possible. I guess once the dust has settled and we feel comfortable that we've explored a lot of the design space and, and that our design um, solves our requirements. I guess there will be a phase of uh, peer review, of simplification, and then at the very end, what I'd like to have is kind of um, formal proofs, um, maybe have, have some sort of formal model and work a little bit like what Cardano is doing, but maybe slightly less pedantic, uh, and actually write proofs that, that our design is, is coherent. 
uh, and then maybe even go down the route of formal verification for s specific components. Uh, I think maybe there has been some effort on FFG there, and we can take it uh, one step further with other components. One thing I like doing in protocol design is trying to see if we can write down a list of desiderata and then just basically derive the protocol from the desiderata and show that it's pretty much the only option. And like there are some ways in which uh, in, in which we are getting somewhat closer to that. So like for uh, for example, the um, like there's results about uh, results about properties that you want from the fork choice rule. There's um, results about uh, what we want in terms of efficiency. There is results in terms of uh, what we want in, term, you know, in, ter um, in terms of predictability. And if we can make kind of like better and better arguments over time that basically show either this is the best approach or at the very least there is nothing that can, that, that's uh, you know, like within reach of implementability that's uh, sufficiently substantially better than the approach, that's when uh, you end up uh, getting more stability. Um, so I guess one example of that is like if you look at proof of stake research, right? I feel like it was uh, very kind of floaty in the air about like two to three years ago and like we went through a whole bunch of ideas, but now you know, like we have the, the uh, Casper FFG family, we have the CBC family, and there's uh, formal proofs that, the, that um, FFG works. There's like a uh, safety proof of CBC, but not yet a liveness proof, ahem, ahem. Well, you have a spot of liveness, I have that too. Right, okay, well, if you have a good plausible liveness, uh, do you have a good? You, you've even given the plausible liveness proof. Okay, okay, true. Um, the, um, the, no, the, that was a um, questioning tone of confirmation, not a questioning tone of suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, and there's also proofs that like both of these are in some ways within you know, like something like 20% of being optimal. So once you get to, uh, once you get to that, then you do get, um, like, that does basically mean that things are kind of like much more stony in that way, right? The next thing that I personally want to see becoming more stony is like uh, proof of stake fork choice rules. So basically prove that, you know, there is basically, one, like, there are choices of structure, but there basically is one and only way to make a good fork choice rule that satisfies a bunch of properties. Ghost. Right, yeah, and ghost, like th that's pretty much my philosophy too, right? That like ghost is the optimum and we either use that or find like very, very good approximations for it. Um, so, like, if we can sort of like set the fork choice rule in stone and possibly even formally prove properties of the fork choice rule. Um, so, like, one example of, of a property that I want to formally prove is it's, you know, it's impossible to censor more than 50% plus epsilon of all validators, um, assuming everyone is offline and you control 50% minus epsilon. Um, another one in my, I mean, might be properties about like, difficulty of censoring selectively, right? So, and you want these results to be ideally as independent of the random number generator as possible. So, if you can kind of like prove, move toward proving results like that, then that comes closer to like basically saying, okay, this is a fortress rule, and we know for a fact that we have, that we can prove these properties, that it's impossible to get properties that are asymptotically better, and so we have something that we can kind of settle on and assume it's not going to change. Yeah, you should talk more. Uh -huh. No, I have a question for the protocol designers. Mm -hmm. So what will be like the perfect trend in your mind? Mm. Imagine if like computing the timestamp of a piece of data, where, uh, of when a piece of data was published was like a mathematical function that you could evaluate. So you could compute like when a piece of data was published to the internet the same way you could compute its hash, and then we would have like consen that we would not even need consensus, and we would have 100% fault tolerance. That's like optimal. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not going to get anywhere close to that. But no, like in the um, I feel like the um, like in general, in a very wide sense, right? The optimal protocol is one that has the properties we want to a reasonably close approximation and where we can prove that you can't get uh, better properties without sacrificing something else that we care about even more. 
And I think that like to build on that at the same time, perfection in terms of the process would be also like defining, you know, step by step, how do we actually get there and, you know, implementing each one uh, uh, incrementally and getting close enough that we can support a decentralized uh, application ecosystem and, and not like we don't need the absolute, you know, highest TPS. We just need, you know, just enough, at least for now, to get us to the next step and, you know, make developer experience good enough. Um, and and then pass it to Danny. And to keep these components uh, as modular as possible, as we discussed earlier, so that we're not stuck. So we don't have a protocol that like almost does what we want to do, but you know we wish they did it this way or that way. Um, so to keep thing, keep the design very, very modular. And definitely, uh, oh, just, yeah. And also, like, transaction security. Like, what I really like is I like the idea that, you know, you can sign a transaction, and depending on what the, you know, what kind of transaction it is, you get different levels of security, and you're okay with different levels of security. And, like, the more you wait, the more ingrained it gets, and the, you know, if you sign it immediately and it's a state channel, then you get, like, some level of instant, but then, you know. So I like these kind of uh, gradations of security. Um, so what is a good enough developer experience? Because I think a lot of developers don't really care about the details of the consensus okay. protocol or whether it's five second blocks or 10 second blocks. They mm -hmm. just want to know how painful is it going to be to build a DAP that scales? Agree. Um, so one example of a developer experience that's definitely good enough, at least from the point of view of a blockchain, is something equivalent to what the current Ethereum blockchain provides. Obviously, you know, like plus somewhat shorter block times if we um, if we can get them. So the goal of, of sharding from an experience point of view, right, is not to make the experience better. It's to massively increase capacity without making the experience much worse. And if if we can get if we can not decrease developer experience at all, then that's the obvious optimum. And if we can increase then from there, it's a kind of bargaining game of like, well, you can decrease it this much, maybe you can do a bit better, but, the, but at the cost of a large number of changes to the protocol, but then if those large number of changes are gonna be um, are like extreme complexity, maybe it's better to do it at layer two. From a rollout standpoint, my personal view is that we want um, Ethereum 2.0 to be something that like, actually can promise sort of higher levels of immutability in certain respects. So basically, whatever guarantees we come out with on day one should be guarantees that we're really confident about. And if there are guarantees that we're not confident about, well, then we should just like roll out with those features disabled and then add them on when the research gets done and we can become confident. So that's part of my preference, for example, for like cross links and like not, la uh, not launching with uh, you know, like very strong uh, uh, cross shard communication uh, cap uh, capability or possibly even like in shard cross contract uh, transact, uh, synchronous transaction capability immediately so that we have more time to choose whether or not we're willing to commit to synchrony. I think also for a developer experience, I know this is a sharding workshop, but it's certainly important to just like reiterate that every single person here is like some of the most knowledgeable people about Ethereum. And so any work that you can do to like, you know, spread the information of how to build decentralized applications and how to reason about them. Like we have this adversarial thinking that we've been talking about this entire time where it's like, okay, if the attacker does this, what do we do? How is our protocol robust against these kinds of, you know, manipulations? And so this is something that I don't think people as application developers on the broader space like are really, that's not front in their consciousness, but it is front in all of ours because we're living in this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer kind of system. And so I, at least one of my biggest things is like, okay, how do we, you know, developer tools is certainly a, a, a key aspect here, but also just like communicating the vision and communicating the, you know, ways that we develop these protocols. And that's why like what I'm really interested in is like, okay, the sharding protocol has a thousand different components because it is like the using the bleeding edge of decentralized tech. But then each one of these components can be used for things like plasma chains, used for things like state channels, used for things like, you know, f reasoning about other economic mechanisms that even exist off chain that exist in centralized servers. So it's really this mentality that I think is the most important. And so like, let's develop sharding, let's build these protocols, but then let's also like keep decentralization alive. I guess 
the the more design things we kick out to layer two, I guess the less usable the system is by developers out the gate, um, and the longer it's going to take for us to build up the the tools and the ecosystem to allow the developers to like be able to cleanly work in the sharding landscape. Um, and I I think it's it's a it's a trade off certainly, but um, I think that's the best way to manage the complexity, at least from like a, a research standpoint. If the research isn't there, then kick it to layer two for the time being. Um, with knowing that there's probably gonna be growing pains in people transitioning um, and trying to um, address those earlier rather than later. I mean, in terms of developer experience, I'm actually um, more optimistic than, than Vitalik. I think the sharding developer experience will be much, much better than what it is now. I mean, just the fact that we have five second blocks with low variance, that we have finality, that we have a really good random beacon, uh, that we'll have a better VM, um, and probably other things that I'm missing um, will help. Um, I guess another thing, just to give an example of uh, what Carl was saying, is that the, the research that we're doing at, for sharding like, is pretty generic, it's very modular. It's, the ETH research posts tend to be like very small ideas. And um, just this morning, um, Truebit announced that uh, they would be using uh, proofs of independent execution together with their forced errors. So you know, that's a piece of, sh uh, of, uh, of sharding research uh, which is being used at uh, layer two. And so I think we're gonna see more and more of, uh, of that happen as soon as uh, we educate um, you know, the developers on, on the research that has been happening. Just like one one example of this kind of like layer two, layer one thing is that like there have been multiple decentralized Twitters that have come up on Ethereum and, and exist on Ethereum. And Twitter is definitely a good use case in terms of, you know, we do want some kind of like decentralized censorship resistant stuff. But if we were to like scale this decentralized Twitter, we clearly can't publish every single tweet on chain. We don't really need like everything to be on chain for Twitter. If you use hash links, then you know the ordering of your tweets for one particular user. You have private keys and you do need pieces for that, for like identity and for tr uh, like sending money and for, you know, putting bonds for your tweets or, you know, there are a million mechanisms that you can use on Ethereum, but it's like developer experience is also saying, okay, this is, <laughs> don't necessarily just like put a tweet in a transaction unless there, there, I know Vitalik likes putting tweets and transactions at times because we don't have like the scale yet. So I, I'm going to get in trouble. But nonetheless, keep it off chain and make a good user experience. I'm actually, and I think the use case for you for like what to do with shards before they become usable for code yes. isn't even no, isn't even just Twitter. I was actually thinking about storing the uh, user interfaces and like other content related to decentralized applications. Uh, so, like, basically, if people want to use dApps and, like, either a swarm isn't ready or they happen to want something which is, like, even higher guarantee and availability than swarm, then they can just, like, shove uh, like, the data if it's under 100 kilobytes or whatever into a shard. Possibly if it's even up to a megabyte, you just have to pay more. Now, a small question. Just, so now the a reward in the short chain is no longer the virtual Ether, right? It's the real Ether? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we mean by this? Because uh, back to the, in Taipei, mm -hmm. the reward of the short chain are oh, actually oh, not the real. Um, so in the current spec so far, all of the um, incentive accounting happens on the beacon chain and like what's drawing is just the stub, right? Now, the, the intention is definitely for beacon chain deposits plus their rewards to be withdrawable into shards and for there to be a, a money, a pa eventually a pathway for moving ether from the main chain straight into shards. Mm. So like virtual ETH is sort of real ETH in that way. Mm. I, have, I have a different question. Okay, so uh, you guys, uh, like uh, just because Swam just come up, it was kind of a thought from this event uh, that it's 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 funny because uh, the 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 swarm team has been doing its own research also on 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 things like proof of custody for a long time, and it's actually supposed to be like a 
reliable thing to uh, a rel reliable system to uh, to uh, store things and ensure that they stay available. They do have like a messaging solution available and things like that. So, how are you guys thinking about you know maybe collaborating with the Swarm effort more to maybe use it to just you know store your stuff and yeah. send your stuff? Yeah, and I think one very natural area of collaboration is that we do need a uh, storage layer for blockchain history and we do need a storage layer for receipts and we need a uh, decentralized search engine for receipts because like ultimately searching bloom filters for topics is like nowhere close to enough yeah. so like i think that that does naturally form a kind of one of the initial killer apps for a uh, swarm yeah but then the question is because i mean as far as i can see in in the in the in the sharding protocols uh it does ha require uh, built-in proof of custody to mm -hmm. ensure that like immediate history is live. Uh, couldn't yeah. that kind of facility also be provided by, by, by Swarm then? I mean, it does the proof of custody anyway. Um, so I think like the, the main problem is that a proof that a, a, that a file has a proof of custody needs to be included. Like first of all, it needs to be included in the consensus layer. And second, to get the guarantees that we're looking for, it has to be specifically the randomly selected subset of validators. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So well, basically, the, yeah. So our goal with the kind of random sampling um, plus um, uh, proof of custody and plus like proofs of execution is to try to move the model from being honest majority to being uh, or for being uh, to being kind of like uncoordinated, economically rational majority. Yeah. And so, like, basically, unless a very large portion of participants are kind of coordinating to attack, then it, it would be in people's um, interests to uh, only participate in ways to keep the system running safely. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, I, I, I really th think, like, you guys should consider, like, using Swarm more because I okay. do think it has, like, interesting yeah, properties well, that might help you. I agree. You know, we should definitely talk more. So uh, one cool idea in terms of uh, making use of the shards before the VM uh, comes out is um, in terms of having a, a plasma chain to pay for transaction fees uh, out of band. So, I mean, that's even something that I think would be very valuable once we have an EVM in the shards because who wants to have you know, a balance on a thousand shards just in case they want to make a transaction on, on this shard or that shard? So I think it, it makes sense to have... Uh, one or even many plasma chains where you can have a single balance in ETH, and then in the plasma chain you can say, I will pay um, the first proposer who includes this transaction on this shard, and that's how much I'm paying them. Um, so yeah, that's a way to basically get a initial value from the shards even when there's no EVM to incentivize the transaction inclusion. And it's also something that will be valuable once the shards uh, have uh, an EVM. Just to kind of like expand on that a tiny bit, the biggest problem with Plasma is this data availability thing, right? You, you don't really know if the Plasma operator has published all of the data for the block. Just They could have just published the block header or Merkle root and like missing a lot of transactions. And so you can use this sharding infrastructure, which is basically a like short-term availability solution. So you know that this data is downloadable or it will not be included in a shard. You can use that for a Plasma chain to like give the guarantees that you you know are missing in in most constructions, um, and so you basically what you're doing with that is you're mitigating this kind of exit, um, like not yeah this mass exit vulnerability, which is not as bad in certain circumstances, but essentially you don't want your plasma operator to be able to force users to exit ever because that is just like a griefing vector. So you can like kind of solve this, which is cool. Yes, what's up? Hi, so um, what are the, uh, the darkest rooms left to be illuminated when it comes to sharding? You know, what are, what are, what are the, the biggest uh, known unknowns? Hmm. Good question. Um, so what one kind of somewhat fine one is like, what level of efficiency for Starks is actually possible? 
And the answer, basically, like that's kind of like a positive leaning dark room because if it's possible to get Starks down to some like absurdly low low size, then there are way more applications to use them for than just aggregating signatures and uh, uh, doing VDFs. So, for example, verifying block correctness, recursively verifying block correctness, verifying block availability, and then we can uh, get rid of fraud proofs in many cases. And one, if you have like extremely perfect kind of inst like, like instant like extremely fast uh, general purpose uh, succinct proofs, then you can, like that massively helps even uh, scalability and like it opens the door to super quadratic scalability in a bunch of ways. Um, another uh, one, uh, another dark room that's kind of more on the dark, on the dark side of darkness is um, basically the, the way in which the kind of community would respond to the economics of proof of stake in practice. Like basically because like, the, you know, the economic model is definitely one that has been kind of philosophized over very heavily, but it has not been uh, tested. And, and like the number of people who have uh, worked on proof of stake with math equations is definitely, like, it's definitely the case that I think even many of them have not asked the question of like, given the current sense of structure, do I personally feel comfortable with like shoving half of my ETH into this, partic into this particular model? And um, that's, so the way, you know, like, are there centralization incentives? Are there, like, do the anti-centralization incentives actually work? Um, will everything just coalesce into like two pools that are controlled by yeah, Bitfinex and like whoever else ends up running, you know, like the EOS delegate nodes or whatever? Um, like, um, like we have sort of philosophically come up with, uh, you know, a, a bunch of mitigations and a bunch of ways to uh, kind of like make the out of the proof stake more friendly in practice, but like this is stuff that has not been run in the wild, and until it has been run in the wild, there is a certain uh, degree of unknowableness that's not going to be crossed. So, so these things aren't technical questions; they're more sort of sociological in, in that sense, right? Um, yeah, it, it, like there's. There's technical element, elements to them. So like for example, the feasibility of uh, running you know, like certain kinds of centralized proof of state questions in practice. But like it definitely is like, like a, lo a lot of the extents to which say proof of stake will succeed at being decentralized is definitely as sociological as it is technical. Like it's basically the, the extent to which centralized providers are capable of providing more convenience and the extent to which users value this convenience. And like I do think that the centralization, in, a decentralization of proof of stake battle will be fought along those dimensions even more than a lot, uh, than along the economic ones, and that's you know, that, that definitely is like that kind of unknown that can't be as easily put into equations. Um, another one is also incentives that have to do with capital lockup and how the market will deal with uh, so capital lockup of validator swats and how capital lockup of validator slots will end up being priced and like how people will choose to participate in that versus participating in by say putting their deposits behind uh, like state channel constructions or interactive verification constructions and the extent to which um, like the, how those will interact, how those will compete with each other. I mean, on the intersection of making sure proof of stake is properly decentralized and of um, dark rooms, I guess one new dark room that was um, pointed out to me um, recently during this event was, um, is our protocol friendly to decentralized staking pools? Um, and it turns out that maybe not, um, especially in regards to Randall. So, um, you know, with Randall, you need uh, a a single entity to to reveal the commitment, and we're going to have a slashing condition so that um, you don't reveal too early and and, and basically break the, um, the the source of entropy. Uh, but if you have this unique revealer, how does it play with uh, a decentralized uh, staking pool? That's still an open question. Well, it's solvable with that distributed key generation, but like not easily. <laughs> You mean some sort of... Um... Well, basically, every uh, participant, uh, uh, participant PI generates a value XI, secret shares it in, and like gives participant J, like XIJ, and then uh, participant J gets all of the XIJ pieces, and then like Lagrange interpolates them all together, and then you have like elliptic 
curve verifiability, verifiability on all of that, and this all happens off chain. Like, it's a primitive, and academics have a name for it, but like at the same time, it is hard. <laughs> okay, so you have this scheme to agree on the secret. Right, but you also need to pre-compute the whole hash chain. Right, so basically this kind of approach would not have a hash chain, it would have like a list of hashes that get revealed over time. Okay, so we need to, we need to change the protocol yeah. to be friendly, okay. One thing, like it, it will, I think, reduce the, or sorry, it will, uh, re, yeah, no, it will reduce the difficulty of creating um, centralized staking pool solutions that have some degree of trustworthiness, which is both somewhat worrisome because it'll increase the extent to which people are willing to trust them, but but also really good because basically even if like 40% of all the staking ETH ends up being locked inside one of them, it would still be, like because of the trusted hardware itself, it would still be uh, like very difficult for, any, for anyone to use that power to do anything bad. No, you definitely cannot use trusted hardware to commit to being online. So, um. Phil has a question. I could say a dark corner. I'll, I'll just say while it goes, um, just a, uh, uh, like, cross shard communication developer experience like that is a question for me and like the actor model if we decide that asynchronous calls between contracts are the way to go that's another big question right how do we actually make that a nice developer experience and the migration path for solidity and viper to that is also another question so it's a, basically a lot of work not like technically right. so another dark room is like paths for migration from this sharding spec to radically different sharding specs that may be better. Um, so one, <laughs> the, no, like, so like one example of this is super quadratic sharding that might be enabled with uh, in base, like Starks and uh, like, be, like very efficient proofs of uh, correctness and proofs of data availability. Um, one example of this is like various kinds of dy dynamic sharding schemes. Um, like, I would personally favor just like saying there is an entire category of complex spooky stuff that's not allowed for Ethereum 2.0 and we should just be okay with waiting five to ten years for it to come in Ethereum 3.0. Um, and we should be willing to say that, you know, something like ten year, five to ten years from now is the expected release date of an Ethereum 3.0 type thing. Um, if we want to actually do, uh, if that's uh, something we want to actually do. but. Uh, there are, kind of, like, there definitely are technological unknowns sort of going in that direction. So one fun thing that Vlad and I were discussing related to the trusted hardware comment earlier was that you could actually build, let's say, a pool for, uh, for storage and then not have to reveal the S in the proof of custody construction to whoever's running the pool, plus use availability bonding to make sure that essentially like their risk of being offline is greater than yours of being slashed. So I guess my question is, um, with the fact that it seems like new technologies can always sort of alter the internal incentives of the protocol in ways that we can't predict, mm -hmm. do you think Ethereum will ever be done? Like will done, be done. Like, like set in stone and, hmm. or is it something that's constantly going to be evolving and, and iterating? Um, I mean, realistically, I personally do want it to be something where the development can like, slow down much more over time. Um, another thing worth pointing out is that a lot of these constructions are in some ways stop gaps until what I do think is the 3.0 utopia, which is basically using uh, general purpose uh, succinct proofs um, to uh, ver fully verify block uh, validity and then use uh, the um, erasure code construction to allow a kind of same random sample checking of data availability. And when, like, basically if that like w with that like that does like that does solve a lot of the problems that we have right now. Um, another thing is um, that uh, at least I'm trying to design the protocol deliberately to have kind of redundant components that try to ensure the um, correctness of properties in redundant ways. 
So one example of this is that for shard block validity, you have um, you, you have the random sampling mechanism, you have the proof of cut proofs of custody with validator bonds, um, you have um, the potential for like various forms of uh, client side data availability checking. So, like the goal is definitely to have multiple primitives. So if future developments end up breaking one of them, then the others are still standing. Um, just uh, in terms of uh, risk of uh, desolidifying the, the spec, um, maybe uh, external research from other teams. So I know that you know there's um, Definity that's doing research in sharding, Cardano. Uh, I think, yeah, of course, Vlad. Um, <laughs> Vlad's internal, yes. Um, I mean, what I, what I gather is that, for example, Definity and Cardano, they, they kind of work privately, and then once they're happy with the, the, the ideas, they release a, a white paper, and it's possible that in one of these white papers, there's gonna be a 10x idea that we wanna incorporate, and that might, um, you know, lead to a redesign. So, um, I'll, repeat, I'll repeat a comment, which is that we can kind of balance the, extent, the possibility of good ideas in, not fully, but in some respects, if we prove mathematical bounds on optimality, right? So, like, one very simple example is um, if we look at the cost of processing a certain number of validators, then we know that, like, we did the math, and if you look at a BLS aggregate signature, like, basically, the bit field is already much larger than the signature. And so we know that information, theoretically, it's not possible to achieve more than, like, a few percent more gains within the same structure. Now, granted, you can try radically different structures, like, finding ways to kind of shard the entire consensus. But then for that, the other thing that we can do is we can look at, like basically proofs that, that, that say, um, we, we can look at the argument of kind of how much we'll ever need. So for example, the, sh the current sharding spec can handle up to you know, like four million validators. And I think a reasonable upper bound for how many validators we definitely don't need more than is basically the world population. So realistically around like eight, eight, eight billion or so. And even with much less than that, you know, you still get very high levels of decentralization. So, eight billion is definitely a number that we could get to with like Moore's, a decade of Moore's law all, all by itself if we need to, right? So, well, if we can, we what, can. What if four of the eight billion are Joe Lubin though? Well, that's something that, <laughs> so that's something that cannot be improved by incre um, increasing the uh, decentralization capacity, uh, capacity of the base layer blockchain. But he'll. But you still get slashed if you're evil, no matter how rich you are. Ooh, ooh! What if we discover a technology for slashing uh, Joe Lubin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. What was it? They. I think they tried one, and they're shutting it down and updating the constitution. <laughs> if anything, Joe Lubin would be electing all the block producers in that system, right? So. Until we get slashed. So you might not want to implement it. Mm. <laughs> No E O. We love Pegasus. <laughs> um, I'm personally excited to start building this spec and, um, you know, being flexible as it grows, but uh, starting to get it out the door. I, feeling somewhat confident that that's uh, that it's time so. and i'm feeling good about solidifying portions of the spec and very much communicating and talking with shaw way about the peer-to-peer -peer network i'm sorry i keep talking about this peer-to-peer -peer network but other things too not just that also the the finality gadget with a, a concept of a beacon chain and coming up may i feel like there's an there could be an interesting way to like do that where we don't actually, where we can have like some kind of test net where we don't, that we don't have to pivot away from very easily. Because I mean, the finality logic is still there. Um, there is a chain that exists in, uh, concurrently. That is the big decision. Like, do, do we somehow go back on this beacon chain idea? I think is like a, definitely a key thing that's in my head. Um, and I don't see why we would at this moment. Um, so it seems reasonable that the beacon chain will survive in some capacity. And so if you have a chain that finalizes another chain and on a peer-to-peer -peer network that is sharded, 
you are now very, very far away. I mean, very, very close, but far away from the ultimate end, which we all will face. Sorry, that was weird. No, that, that remind that was the title of one level of a video game I played like 10 years ago where one of the levels basically had the start and the end be like literally three meters away from each other but separated by a, like a, a basically a cliff that it was just too long to jump over and so he had to do this really big long journey that took many hours. Wow, mm. cool. Yeah. It's a fun metaphor. Yeah. We're already at the end if you yeah. really think about it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I guess, so Ethereum is a very transparent discussion on the ETH research. And Ether, um, on the Gitter, we have a sharding channel and so many blog posts, Vlad's Twitter, Vlad Vitalik's Twitter, and that's all the news. Oh, it's very boring. <laughs> And so um, I'd like to thank all the um, attendees coming from far away or just in Berlin but, and sacrifice your Sunday to join this uh, meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one is that uh, we will have a dinner uh, about 10 minutes, uh, after 10 minutes. And then uh, again, then we think uh, status. Yeah. Uh, and the wonderful life peer team. And of course, uh, Israel Foundation. My personally, uh, personally, thank you. And thank Sean Wake for amazing shouting research and implementation and leading and devving and awesome stuff. Thank you, Paul. So, thank you, everyone.